I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Okay. Our mutual friend, Nick uh, Hot Wheels, sent me a, a message last night mm-hmm. that was um, okay. uh, earth-shattering in a, in a good way. And that is, um, I learned that if you mix Mountain Dew with Blue Gatorade, like a splash of Blue Gatorade, you just made Baja Blast. Like, you can just make Baja Blast anytime you want. I went out... Is that really what Baja Blast is? It's, if you take regular Mountain Dew and just add a splash of cool Blue Gatorade, bada bing bada boom, done. Baja Blast. Hmm. It was perfect. Huh. Yeah, so highly recommend. I've been doing that all night. Uh, just, that's news Just today. making homemade... Yeah, punch that shit in Google, too. You'll, 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 it comes up. If you just type in, like, Blue Gatorade, Baja Blast. It's just... Uh, d- blue Gator... G- aid. Yeah. Baja... Last, it auto completed. Yeah. Now people have all the ratios wrong. You just need to do a splash. Someone had like a thirty percent blue. That's far too much blue Gatorade. Just do a splash. Like even eighty five fifteen. I see a lot that not even fifteen percent. Like five percent blue Gatorade, and it gets you there. Huh. Yeah. So screw you, Taco Bell. I'm gonna make my own bootleg Gatorade. Sell or sorry, my own bootleg Baja Blast. It's the syrup from the failed Pepsi Blue. Is that what's in Blue Gator? So, no, in in oh Baja Blast, they use the Baja Blast as a combination of the Pepsi Blue and like the the syrup for Pepsi Blue. Yeah, and Mountain Dew. Huh. Interesting. I didn't know that. That is interesting. Actually, on the topic of just making your own bootleg soft drinks, here's a uh, another hack that I've been doing for a couple of years. I didn't realize people probably don't know this. If your doctor has a patient portal, you can just use that instead of mm-hmm. like appointments and save yourself hundreds of dollars. Right? Because every time you go to what do you mean? Every time you go to the doctor's office, it's the thirty dollar copay for the fifteen minute visit, or yeah. you could just send them a message through the patient portal, and like they can still write cut you prescriptions and shit like that through the patient portal. So I've just been doing that for like a couple of years and it saved me. You can also call call them. Yeah, you can call them too. And it just saves you so much money and you don't have to, like there's stuff you might have to go in for, but for a lot of stuff, that shit's just free. Like those weird bleeds. You can just get all that shit for free. It's great. Don't tell, Brandon, don't get our, don't get the podcast censored. For what? We're gonna get for for giving away giving away big medicines bullshit secrets. <laughs> I don't fucking know. This. I don't know. My brain is not functioning properly lately, so like I'm having a time. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> I, I I this entire morning I I had to so this morning I was like waking up. And for like a good two hours, I was in, I was trapped in a loop where I didn't know what was going Wait, on. Wait, were you just in I like a, do something. a boot cycle? Just like, just like I was constantly doing that? I did something, forgot that I was doing it while I was doing it, and then had to go to the top, forgot I was doing it as I was going to the top of it. And it just kept spiraling. So, Yeah. <laughs> That's where I'm at You've today. You've got that going for you. <laughs> so that was good. That was all good and nice, especially considering the fact that I have, I have like rebuttals to write tomorrow for Kai, which is the paper, like the the thing I. Jesus fucking Christ! Not not the Chinese food <laughs> restaurant across the street, where you ate no. dozens no. of of Szechuan dumplings. 
not dozens. I had there were twenty. I had fifteen. Okay. Oh, uh, I had okay. Fifteen Szechuan no, sorry, dumplings you... in a sit. A sitting. Fifteen. I'm gonna start calling fifteen a John's dozen. <laughs> it, it it was also because I felt weird because I accident they they accidentally gave me two waters. Because I they, said they... I'll have one also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So or I, I, I think, think no. I well, said I I'll have one too. I'll have one too. Yeah. And they I, heard, I think it was something I'll like you said two. you'll have one too, or or like you said you want one also, and they were like how many, and you said two because I think there was like two for the both of us, and then you just got two. Yes. And they were like, oh, this boy loves his Szechuan. Yeah, and then the dude was like, uh, the guy who run, ran the place was just like watching me eat. And was like, I don't know. I was wondering how far along you'd get. <laughs> yeah, because that's a lot of dumplings. Uh, not super interesting radio, but just uh, on, on giving tips to listeners. This is the second to last. This is the penultimate daylight savings time. One more, then we're done with this shit forever. Um... For the for the people who are in specific areas of the United States, yeah, for people in the specific yeah. areas of the United States that still use daylight savings, and then uh, oh, my also my final tip because it's that time of season again. If you're checking out anywhere, never ever ever round up to the nearest dollar to donate to yeah, any of that ever, and just donate directly. Because what they do is they take all of your yeah. money, donate it, and then they get like a huge tax break for donating the money you get. So you're just like giving Petco or Quick Check or whatever, like huge tax breaks by doing it. Just don't do that. Mm -hmm. Go donate to the whatever the fuck they were doing because they're just taking your money to get tax. That's mm -hmm. fucking crazy. Like, don't Pretty do much. that. <laughs> Welcome to Cryptopedia, an exploration of the myths and legends that haunt the human mind where each week we will take you on a journey exploring the mysteries of the world, tackling the tales of monsters, folklore, the paranormal, and that thing that definitely lives under your bed. I'm Brandon. I'm John, and I might be either the funniest I am today or the least funny I've been in a while. We'll find out. We will see. We will find out. And, and I want to continue the theme. It's it's all Spooky's Eve. I wanted to do a Halloween episode, um, even though it's November, because I like I'm not willing to. I know they started playing Christmas music already, but I'm not ready to to, to let loose my grip on this yet. So I'm gonna do another uh, uh spooky place. I mean. I know I joked about it before, but like the Treehouse of Horror has released multiple episodes in November. Yeah, because it's great and it's totally worth it. Um, so this week we're going to uh, are we going to do Canada's An Amherst Mystery, which I found by accident while looking up another uh, oh. thing that turned into like a grab bag thing. But this one actually turned into a full episode. Um, am I gonna am I gonna get just like depressed by the end of this because it's set in Canada? Uh, no, this isn't one of the Canada sads. Right, I've, 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 I'm, I'm. Are you sure? Because like, yeah, no, I, I'm being sh so. I'm, I'm very cautious with Canadian, <laughs> Canadian offense. This one is uh, fine. <laughs> it's fine, actually. Well, full disclosure. We're gonna find out. I'll, 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 I'll like. I, I wrote this in August. On August 1st. Um, so this is basically new for me yeah. again, too. I just remember writing it and thinking... I, I remember good. having a good feeling about it, and that's about it. All right. Well, I'll uh, while we go, I'll be looking for connections to uh, residential schools for Amherst. So let's have fun with that. There's, <laughs> I, I, don't th I don't think this has any connection to, uh, to schools. Brandon... Um, Brandon, you know you're the, just not yeah. trying hard enough. I'm not. Tr yeah, I'm just not trying hard enough. <laughs> you're just not trying hard enough. Uh, <laughs> so we know about the events, in this case, a haunting of a poltergeist from the recount of uh, Walter Hubel, not to be mistaken by, uh, uh, by Hubie, the fantastic, actually good Adam Sandler film. I enjoyed Hubie Halloween. Um about this time, I feel like Brandon uh, from I, June of. 18th, I feel like that's a hot take you just made. I, you know, I actually I liked Hubie Halloween so much. I went onto the replica uh, uh, prop forum to see if people had uh, replicated his thermos, and uh, the answer is yes. I 
I can give you the exact model thermos that Adam Sandler has in Hubie Halloween. I hate it. Um, I I, so it, I feel like I, I feel like it. there was backlash um, about that movie because of the character that Adam Adam Sandler played. Because there may have been. I watched it last year, so it's another thing where I don't remember anything about the thermos. <laughs> so, and so what I would say then. What I would say then is your fa- you you enjoyed the thermos from that movie, but you don't remember any of the <laughs> other details. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's absolutely true. I remember just the thermos. Oh, so this happened from June of eighteen seventy nine to August of eighteen seventy nine, two months in uh, Amherst, Nova Scotia. Walter, I presume, considered himself uh, a touch immune to spoofs or effects of psychic acts. And similar at the, uh, the given his experience as a stage performer. So we've got kind of like, um, uh, who's that? Magi- oh, why am I drawing Houdini? a blank? Houdini? Not Henry Calville. The Houdini. Uh, uh, Harry uh, Houdini, Brandon. not Henry Cavill. Um, Houdini's like, like yeah. literally one of the most famous, like, magicians, escape artists in human history. Like. Yeah. And Henry Calville is yeah. Superman. It's you can, It's you know maybe my brain's not firing. Uh, I figured out. I found the. Sometimes. I found the connection to um, things being awful, Brandon. But it you, took me. It only took me. It took me a little while because I had to. Um, oh, you, my computer's or, running slow. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so Amherst, the local like indigenous like first nations folks um let's see the evidence is quite clearly this guy was murderous he did a number on the mikamak people uh said francis pointing to amherst's apparent role in advocating the use of smallpox lace bait blankets against indigenous people we have to get the history right and so far the side of the history we know about the side that was written by the people who committed these atrocities that's not good enough so uh, maybe not this story, but Amherst is a hellhole. So, oh, Amherst is that's anywhere like that. If we're talking about a, a guy named <laughs> Walter H- Hubel in a, in well, a okay. area that had indigenous people, like if like any, if we're talking about anywhere so that used I, to have I'm not people, sure there's terrible if, things that have happened. I'm not sure if Walter Hubel did it. I was talking more about the person who the town's named for. Yeah. Oh, Amherst. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying, like, if we're talking about, like, yeah, I mean, we haven't gotten that far yet, but basically a community of exclusively white people in an area that mm-hmm. definitely had First Nations people there first. There's, 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 you, it, you don't have to dig too far to get the sands. Things are fucky wucky, if you will. Yeah, things get fucky wucky. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so he, he was a stage performer, um, uh, and, and it, his job was to trick the audience into believing that so, he himself had magical powers or influence. Um, he's just also a being a trained actor, he, 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 Wait. he's like houdini it. Yeah, which is exactly what Houdini did, because... Yeah, he's, he's a magician that, that, like, goes around and tries to, like, bust psychics. I want to say his mother died, and he got, like, taken for a ride by a fake by, by a psychic medium at some point. Uh, I think you're correct, talking about Henry Cavill. I'm definitely not talking about Henry Cavill. <laughs> Uh, also being a trained actor, he thought himself able to spy any trickery or deception going on and, uh, being able to expose the Amherst mystery house as Uh, a fraudulent act, uh, being put on by the family who lived there at the time. Uh, truth, it has been said. Yeah. It was, it was Houdini's mother. He went to a bunch of like spiritualists and that's why he basically dedicated his life to, uh, exposing spiritualists as fakes. Uh, just, just so those, those of you out there who don't know, um, the spiritual movement is wild. Uh, <laughs> it's buck wild. There's a lot of fucked up weird shit in there. Um, there's, there's one person who had a glove, a child's hand that came out of their vagina, supposedly. There, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> there's, people can hide a lot of things in a lot of places. You didn't think you could hide some things. So there's that. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh 
Uh, truth, it has been said, is often stranger than fiction. What I have written is the truth and not fiction. It is very strange. Walter Hubel, 1888. And uh, before you go and go, hey, Mark Twain said that. Yes, he did. A lot of people said things, but so did everyone else. It's an idiom. It's That's a thing. Everybody says that thing. Um, Twain said it after publishing... Uh, uh, f uh, following the equator in 1897, Walter said it in 1888, and may have been it may have been colloquially used uh, since the earliest use I could find was a Don Juan poem published by Lord Byron in uh, 1819. In our t in our two th two month trip around the world, we ran into long lost relatives on three separate occasions, proving truth is stranger than fiction. Anyway, that was a, a weird rant I went uh, on. To. The poem is is Duan. The, bra the poem yeah, is that's the name of the poem, Juan. not the guy that wrote it. The guy that wrote it is Lord Byron. Yeah, that was a little rant. I want just because everyone's oh, isn't Lord he Byron. Came up, um, what did he? That's Al Lovelace's like uncle, right? Or father. yes, yeah, yeah. You're correct. Yeah, S related to Ada Lovelace and some the 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 person who like basically created the first computer. Uh, yes. Yep. Countess of Lovelace, Nee Byron. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, and it, everyone just attributes that to Mark Twain. So I just wanted to point out it's not just everybody says that, not just Mark Twain. Um. Anyway, <clears throat> on to our poltergeist. This time, you guessed it, a teenage girl. Oh, I might get to have a poltergeist. Like, uh. <laughs> A poltergeist just from because because Pika teening because yeah, I have a daughter and when she teens, I might have a poltergeist. John, I it, Brandon, in in about twelve years I'm gonna need to borrow your spirit box. Brandon, if <laughs> okay, if if you end up having a poltergeist, you have failed uh, in some un, un like unimaginable way as a father. I just want to point that out. Or succeeded greatly. Uh, I'm gonna go with failed. Failed. There's, see, it depends, because, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so, if it's, like, the classical poltergeist, yes, but if she, like, spends way too much time and way too much effort, like, programming a series of, like, radio-controlled Arduinos to, like, go off to scare people all over the house and, like, build them into the walls, I would consider that a wild success. Well then, that's not a poltergeist, Brandon. That's just that's just a nerdy a nerdy teen, and like hiding things in the furniture to like make them fly across the room. That would be awesome. That's just a nerdy teen. That's not a yeah. poltergeist. Uh, it's a fine line. Uh, it's a very fine line. Uh, okay. <laughs> On okay. uh, the afternoon of August 28th, 1878, 19-year-old Esther Cox went out driving with Bob McNe McNeil, a local young man, uh, age unknown, but probably creepy. Um, probably. Bob was, pretty, pretty likely. Bob yeah. was a subordinate of uh, Esther's brother-in-law, Daniel Teed. During their drive, Bob suddenly pulled the buggy over in a remote area and pointed a revolver at Esther, commanding her to get out of the oh. buggy. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, we're going to start strong. Unsure of what plans Bob had in store for her, Esther was terrified and uh, refused. I, Esther's refusal... <laughs> I, I don't even want to make a joke about this, because this is terrible. Oh, yeah. This is like, this is like actually a nightmare. What the yeah. fuck? Yeah, indefensible, some would say. Um, yeah. Esther was terrified and refused. Uh, Esther's refusal made him, made him increasingly irate. But luckily, he was saved by the sounds, or sorry, she was saved by the sounds of another wagon approaching in the distance. Fearing being caught, uh, Bob put the revolver away and drove Esther back home. What? Locals, de locals described Bob as cruel, uh, and he even went so far to say that he would skin cats alive and watch them run about in pain for his amusement. What uh, the fuck, Bob? That That's a gnarly Bob. Uh... I to... I hate Bob. <laughs> he's he's not a protagonist. Well, his name's a palindrome too, which I hate. Ah, oh, the worst. It's not the even worst. a nickname. His full name is just Bob. 
Yeah, no one. He was never named Robert. He was just named Bob because, like, yeah. when he was born, his parents looked at him and they were like, "Yeah, this is gonna be the kind of guy who pulls revol- a loaded revolver on a nineteen-year-old and skins cats for fun." Yeah, Bob is his name. Bob, and that's it. He was said to have left Amherst shortly after the incident, but was still alive in 1879. Within just a few weeks of the attack on Esther, strange Wait, things. Be- yeah, is is this it for Bob in the story? I wonder because like, <laughs> did Bob just like, did Bob just come in, be an asshole, point a gun at this la- this woman, probably with intent to do something very horrible to this person, uh, and then just dip? Because like. <laughs> It's it's Bob. the The point of of unless I'm misremembering, uh, the point of that was to show he, Bob was such an asshole. His name became so, like they start using his name to describe people who are assholes. <laughs> so I I also want to point out. Um, I, I like I want to point out Bob threatened somebody at revolver point. Yes. Right. Uh. And had a habit of, like, skinning cats, supposedly. Yes. Yet, he didn't serve any jail time whatsoever. I'm gonna take a guess, Brandon. Bob's white. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In the 1800s. Yeah. You're, he's a, he, like, he can do anything. It's like, uh, you know, he's got all the cheat codes. Being white in the 1800s is like having all of the cheat codes. Then again, he is named McNeil. Yeah. So he might be Irish, and in that case, well. Yeah. Well, well. Irish, Scottish, maybe. I don't know. I don't Irish, know where, where Bob's from. Irish was like, I being Irish was not considered being white for a while, like being Italian. Well, for, yeah. For yeah. For yeah. I was gonna bring that up to like Italian yeah. and and Greek and what have you. Um. Within just a few weeks of the attack on Esther Strain, things began to happen. Oh, I'll uh, not read that sentence again. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we didn't. We, we had, start oh, that. Oh, I did That's read that. One. You oh, didn't read, read that, it, Brandon. I read it in my head and thought I read it with my face. You're doing the opposite thing that I was doing today. <laughs> yes. Within just a few weeks of the attack uh, on Esther, strange things began to happen at the tea house in Amherst, Nova Scotia. Several ghosts were seen. However, the head ghost would have a number of things in common with Bob, and it was also decided that the ghost's name was Bob. So the ghost is such an asshole, they called him Bob. I mean... He'd have to be a real serious asshole to be put on the level of somebody who pulled a gun on someone. Yeah. And skins cats alive. Like, like... That's, that's like, above norm, the norm of cruelty. Yeah. Oh, also, Esther... Made a very good decision not getting out of the car at gunpoint because if you, some po- you'd never go to a second location. Well, never she already go- she was already going to a second location. Well, she him. thought she was going home, but she was about to be walked into a field and then like potentially be turned into a ghost. And then we'd be talking about the ghost of the Amherst field. That's right. There's oh, okay. I almost made a bad joke. Um, yeah, good, <laughs> good job, Brandon. I, I'm keeping some of them in my noodle now. Um, good, yeah, because there's a lot of bad jokes you could make around this. Oh yeah, yeah, lots lot of, of opportunities. Lots uh, of opportunities. And I applaud worth... you for not making them. <laughs> Thank you. It's worth noting. Uh, it, in the house also lived Daniel Teed, who owns the cottage. Olive and Dan's two young boys, Willie and George, aged five and one. Uh, respectively, Dan's brother, John, Esther, and Olive's brother, William, and the Cox siblings, 22-year-old sister, Jane. So this is another, like, multi-family living situation. Okay, I do want to... Wait, okay. Daniel Tito and the comma, two young boys. Olive and Dan's two young boys. Okay, okay, okay. So, wait, who's Olive again? Uh, who's Olive? Is Olive the name of the girl? Olive... No, Esther. I don't know who Olive is. Olive might be just another person. Maybe Olive is Daniel's. Oh, sorry. Wife. Olive is Dan's baby mama. So okay, there's Daniel okay. Teed, and then I Olive do... and Dan's two young boys. So Olive and Dan have kids. Daniel S- Teed is related to the other Teed. So she's an in law living with them. Okay. 
so I also want to point out um, that oh, wait, Esther and Olive's brother. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Wait a second. Daniel Teed must be Esther's brother. Yeah, because so we've Esther got... and Olive's brother. So Olive must be Dan's baby mama, whether they're it's married Esther... or otherwise. Okay, uh, Olive Cox, because it would be Esther's sister, right? So Olive and Dan is one couple. Is Esther one is couple. like the person on the side. Yes. Billy and George are the children are the of Olive and Dan. Okay. Dan's brother is John. Yes. Um, and the Cox's and sister. Olive has yeah. a brother so named William. So the, yes. And the Cox's siblings, 20 year old sister, Jane. Okay. Okay. I figured it out. I think. Maybe. This. I think we're, this is another poltergeists really like multifamily homes is well, something like I just realized like that um that Australian one where there was the house out in the middle of nowhere and the guy worked for like yeah. a railroad or potato the thing. ghost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the Guria ghost the one where the the one where the person was found with the who just what was last seen with two potatoes in her hands and then was yes! found dead with two potatoes for some reason she was gonna take him back to Ireland yeah that thing yeah. Now, Brandon, what do you think the odds are that this was like a poly seal or something like that? Like a what? A polyamorous. Oh, a poly seal. That I don't. Well, they're all kind of related. So yeah, but think... not not the Coxes. The Coxes aren't related to the Teeds. Yeah, I think this was just a an 1800s multifamily situation, like the the Goria goes. So we don't think it was a fuck shack. It's. Let's see. So there's only two kids. Amber's... There's only two children. So it may not have been a fuck shack. Because there's only the two kids. Were there only two? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're five and one. So this is like early on. And who knows how many kids have died at this That's point? That's true. You, the, you don't list the ones that didn't make it. <laughs> they just don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even give them a name till after they're one. Not in the 1800s, at least. No, it's just, ah, eh, we'll see. It's just them. Um, Esther Cox was said to be a strange girl, exceptionally moody, and unusually fond of pickles. Uh, she had been a tiny baby. Huh, I have, that reminds me of a story from our- High school? Our middle school, in high school days. That does also remind me, I, I, I recall that same story. Uh... <laughs> uh. She had been a tiny. They had to go to a. They had to go to a uh, hospital. The hospital for that, right? Yeah. I mean, some yeah. like you need equipment that's been sterilized because you don't want to throw off any I of be- the the biology going on in there. I mean, you've already thrown off. You've already thrown off I mean, the, yeah. the natural ecosystem by introducing a cucumber. Yeah, branding. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like. At, at that point, you you kind of are already at the point where it's like your pH well, is fucked at that point. We we can't make things worse down there. <laughs> <laughs> at least it wasn't a a broom. Yeah, get the balsamic. Oh, was that was that the same person? Uh, I believe. Or was that, that a different person? That may have been a similar. I can't person. recall. Yeah, I I don't know. Anyway, the moral of the story is don't. Um, if it doesn't do have things. a flange, yeah. If it doesn't have a flange, and if it's something that's easily snappable, um, don't put them in holes. Find, find alternative options. Uh, yeah, there are things you can purchase on the internet that don't that don't break off or disappear inside of you. <laughs> it's like the world's worst vanishing act. But oh, but then if you get enough muscle control, you can treat it like a baby hand. Um, well, then at that point, you're you're just a spiritualist. Yeah. <laughs> you work that muscle until you can. Oh, that, that, there's a whole new reason to do Kegels. Yeah, and get those uh, what should we call Benoit balls? I think they're called Benoit ball. Is that like a te- uh, um, I almost said tanga egg, a yoni egg? Which also don't uh, use, don't do those. Well, not the not the jade ones, especially. Yeah. Don't. Uh. 
Orgasm balls. Venus balls or geisha balls are small what? marble-sized balls, usually hollow, containing a small something. Oh, I've got a small uh, something that I'll give you an orgasm. Usually containing <laughs> Jesus. A small weight that rolls around and are used for some are used for sexual simulation by insertion into the vagina. Available in a variety of forms, the balls may be solid or contain clappers with chives in them. Oh, wait, chives? Don't s- chimes. Oh, chimes. I thought you said chives. I was like, don't season it. <laughs> oh, no. I hate it. <laughs> That's how you can tell if they're all, if you got them all out. Like, you just do a little hop. And if you hear a jingle, you've got some more work to do. Oh, no. Usually they have a string, though. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho, back to the pickles. She was unusually fond of pickles. She had been a tiny baby weighing only five pounds at nine months. Uh, her mother died when she was three weeks old. Aha, she pulled the old twitcheroo. The baby didn't die. The mom died. Haha, <laughs> 1800s. Her father re- uh, subsequently remarried and moved to Maine, leaving her in the care of her grandmother. Under her grandmother's influence, Esther grew up to be an oddly serious old-fashioned girl. So like a little, hmm. like a young old lady. Like, uh, I mean, she grew up to be like, uh, she was emotionally, uh, has Bula. Uh, in three months, Walter Hubble said, well, 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 wait, wait, wait. Okay. She was, emo- she was old fashioned. I mean, I kind of could have guessed that with a name like Esther. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes the names you give people just determines what the type of person they're going to be. I feel like that's. Yeah, like if I, you're a, that is a totally unscientific thing that I said on a podcast that's about skepticism. Yeah, I mean, I will go as far to say, like, if you're a Kyle or a Josh, you're on, you're down yeah. a road, like you're already set on a path, right? It's like naming your kid Bob. It is like naming your kid Bob. Like, there's, it's, there's no adult Joshes or Kyles, and if there are, you, that means you know what a I path. hate. What's that? I just thought the 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 first two like names that popped into my head for Josh and Kyle are a uh, pedophile and a uh, murderer. So oh yeah yeah see it's so far it checks out. Yeah, I mean the the sample size of one so far. I mean that's all you need. And then like that's it. Is it that won't throw off your P rating it, at all? Um, in three, ah, uh, <laughs> Brandon. Yeah. When's the last time you, you calculated significance? Uh, you know, I do it for fun in my free time. I don't, I mean, it's, yeah, we're, sure we're not pee hacking. Um, in three months, Walter Hubble spent, uh, observing these events. He was unable to come to any firm conclusions, uh, in his attempt to supplant the supernatural explanations with more mundane reasoning. <laughs> How'd she get? Where's it go? She eats all these pickles, but she doesn't poop. Um, Hubel's theory was that the well, girls don't poop. At, girls don't know. Actually, I've got a very large sample size that that says otherwise. Ah, <laughs> uh, they don't. Nope. <laughs> it's Doesn't I'm happen. surrounded here. Um. Uh, so Hubel's theory at the time was that the astral body of Bob McNeil had been tormenting Esther at the behest of a demon called Bob Nickel. So, wait, wait, wait. So, in this case, Canadian Houdini is really jumping to some conclusions. It's Bob's all the way down. It's Bob's all the way down. What the fuck? Uh, so, Hubel believed that after the attack, the demon attached itself to Esther and instead was the most active spirit. So, also, where did okay, where did the name Bob Nickel come from? Um, he made it up. But like how? Like what did he what I want to know the like the exact trajectory of Bob McNeil to Bob Nickel. Right? It's so The Bob, Bob part's obvious. The Bob but, part's like, obvious. Obvious. It's it's also the first time I can think of a demon having a last name. Like, when's the last time you heard of a demon with a surname? Um, you haven't. You haven't. No, I definitely have. I, I definitely have. Like outside of anime? No, in like real like. Let me see. Uh, give me a minute. Abaddon, Apoc, Amon, 
Uh, you've got those are all a bunch of the A's, Abzu, uh, Beelzebub, what have you. They're all. They're all. What are the names of the seven devils? Lucifer, Mammon, Asmodeus, Leviathan, Beelzebub, Satan, and Belphegor. They're no, no, no last names. Demons don't have last names because they're cool. Black Pete. Isn't that the Santa? Zwart Pete. That is the bad Santa. Yeah. It was the blackface thing, although he's not a demon. Yeah, he's... <laughs> it's, actually... it's worse. That's bad. Uh... <laughs> he's worse than a demon. Yeah. Don't... Um. Don't... Um... There's... Don't... People can have traditions, but... Uh, don't make blackface part of them. Probably. So, during the evening of September 4th, 1878, Esther and her sister Jane... Ah, 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 Nar Asuman, Asumum. Has a last name? I mean, that's two names. Oh, okay. Okay, you found one. <laughs> We've got... And his brother, Bob. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred evil demon and babe... De- evil and demon baby names. <laughs> Is that what you're going to name your kid? I'm, I literally am not going to have one. I know. Uh, <laughs> Abaddon, Abchanchu, Archeon, Abdeel, Arimon, Amon. This is just like Anubis. Anubis isn't a demon or evil. Yeah. Metal Greymon. That's fucking... Uh... Cerberus. Although, Imagine naming your kid Cerberus. That, although I do kind of want to get a cat and name it like a human name. Like when when these two when these two die in a, in a, uh, how old are they now? In about eight to ten years, I want to get one and just name it like Randall. Just or like Gary, something like that. So like Gary, stop shitting on the carpet. Uh, so Esther and her sister Jane, who shared a bed and bedroom hot we're settling down for the night when jane felt uh what she thought was a mouse crawling inside of her mattress frightened the girl Mm. lit the lamp and searched for the mouse but was unable to find it so what you're telling me is a dibbic tried to crawl into her vagina yes with the pickles (laughs) there's uh what i'm saying is she just is there's a pervert that can cast polymorph running around in the 1800s i mean it just comes to the territory. Once you're a pervert, you get you get the polymorph spell. That's <laughs> it's just a part of the class. Not that... everyone can. Not everyone knows that they can use it, but it's in the class. That's what you do. You transform to a sheep, go hide at a farm, and wait. It's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Later. <then>. Yeah. <laughs> and sensually, ba. Uh, later that night, the sisters heard rustling underneath the bed, determined that it was coming from a cardboard box filled with peaches of patchwork. Uh, when they dragged the box out into the middle of the room, it jumped a foot in the air and landed on its side. The girls mm. screamed for Dan, who came to their rescue, uh, heard their incredible story, laughed and remarked that they must have been dreaming, and pushed the box back under the bed before heading back to sleep. I'm really confused as to what the, like, like how everyone's connected in this household. They're all sisters or in-laws. Or not, sorry, all siblings or in-laws. But if Esther and Jane are sleeping in the same bed... Are they... uh, I think they're... They shared a bed and a bedroom. Gotcha, shared a bed and the bed. Yeah, I think that's just like the economy of beds in that house. But... But uh, I don't know. I'm I'm very confused. Like I, I think they're just having like. Uh, uh, same... I was under the assumption. I was under the assumption that Dan and Esther were together, which is they why I'm confused. Were, but this might have. They might have been sleeping in different beds, right? Because that would be like, especially in a multi-family home, they could be back in the era where it's like untoward for like people of the same sex, even if they're in a relationship, to share a bed. I feel like I feel like it's the 1800s. You're fucking as much as possible, so at least three kids make it to adulthood. Yeah, but you're you're doing that in a hay bale or pretending that you're not. Uh, this is also like the middle of nowhere, Brandon. 
I looked it up. There was like 3,000 people in this town. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So the following evening, Esther, who had gone to bed early on account of a fever, sprang from her bed in the middle of the night and cried, Wake up, Jane, I'm dying. Jane woke up and lit the lamp and to horror found that her sister's face was blood red, her eyes bulging in terror as she trembled in her nightgown. Um, Jane called for the assistance uh, and was soon joined by Dan and Olive, her brother William, and Dan's brother John. Not knowing what else to do, Olive helped her younger sister get back into bed, whereupon all the color drained from Esther's face. Uh, In a choking voice, Esther had declared that, I am swelling up and shall certainly burst, I know I shall. Uh, I think she got one of them 1800s illnesses. You know, I or think just this... had had some bad something, or she just had shellfish for the first time, and guess who's allergic? Uh, Esther, yeah, so apparently. I, th- I think this is less supernatural and more. <laughs> She's terribly ill. Uh, indeed, mm-hmm. Esther's hands and feet were alarmingly swollen. Her complexion now deathly pale, where moments earlier it had been beet red, and her skin was burning with fever, where moments earlier it had been icy cold. How uh, do they know that? I How do they know that? I How do they know. know that? I don't. Because, because if, if Jane had just been woken up by Esther, how the fuck do they know that? It was icy cold before. That, I don't know. You know what, who she's turning into is, um, you ever watch My Hero Academia? Yes. That, are, you, uh, are you talking about? Are you talking about uh, Napoleon? Na- uh, uh, the 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 swirled ice cream boy? No, I'm talking about the the kid. His father is um, Endeavor, and his mom was yeah, Ice Lady. Swirled ice cream boy. Oh yeah, yeah. Swirl- yeah I thought I thought you're uh, talking Todoroki? about that. Is that to- yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's he's got like he's got like strawberry and vanilla ice cream mixed in him. Yeah. I thought you were talking about a character whose power was literally to make ice cream because that's the kind of show where that might be a thing. I mean, technically, if Todoroki was, you know, not wasting all his time making fire, he could make ice cream. That's he could be a true. very He could be a very successful ice cream dealer. He could be. He very, very well could be. He, so Esther is like what Todoroki in real life would be, where you're just like wildly dying <laughs> yeah, you're like actively dying out of bed constantly dying <laughs> like you have both a fever and like just dangerously cold uh well well esther her body still steadily swelling writhed in pain on the bed um a tremendous sound like a clap of thunder sounded in the room shortly thereafter three lead cracks sounded beneath the bed and esther suddenly went limp her appearance having returned to normal uh, when they satisfied themselves that Esther was not dead, but had somehow spontaneously fallen asleep, her bewildered family members eventually returned to their own beds. Um, don't, don't do that. She like was probably wildly ill and then like blacked out. Like she got hor- horrifically sick and her body couldn't take it and passed out. Get a doctor. Eh, I mean, they're in they're in a town of like a couple thousand people. They're not they're not getting a doctor at this hour. What do you fucking think this is? Yeah. Also, nineteen ninety doctor. Like this is the time where you can just like anyone say could be that a you're a doctor. Yeah. Like all you need is a bottle of whiskey and a stick, and you're like, ah, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> some laudanum. Yeah. Just hand, like, some, hand people laudanum and be like, all right, you're done. This is it. You just That's all I got. One of those bags that you see in all the movies, and uh, and and literally no one can say that you're not a doctor. There's no way to say you're not. Was a stethoscope even invented at the time of this story? Probably not. Like this is like the you spe- can just show up to someone's house. <laughs> when was it invented? The stethoscope is one of those things that it, it was invented way later than you would expect it to be. When was the stethoscope invented? Yeah, 1816. This is the okay, okay. It existed. In the eight, oh, it was new, though. It's, it's, it's about 60 20 years. years old. This is 70s. 1860s? Oh, gotcha. 1816. Yeah. So it was, 
It was about 60 years old. Yeah. But you could still show up to someone's house and go, you know what your problem is? You've got too much blood in you. It's I making mean, you sick. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, all that blood kind of getting out of you. <laughs> the following morning, Esther seemed reasonably well, although her appetite was greatly diminished. Still go see a doctor. Four nights later, Esther had a similar attack, probably because she didn't see a doctor. This time, all of the bedsheets flew off her and her sister <laughs> landed in the uh, in a corner of the room as if they had been ripped off by invisible hands. Jane, who had been awake to witness the spectacle, spectacle fainted from fright. Uh, that... <laughs> now... Got her. I don't... <laughs> got her. Well, so... I'm curious to see how, how much of this actually happened, and by that I mean fainting because there's a lot of people fainting in these old stories and i don't know there's no way to really know but i can't just imagine like fainting like a it being an actual like faint that might have is there a way to tell if that's just a thing people did to show surprise i don't rather know than it being like an actual like thing where you like you lose blood to your brain i don't know the only time i've ever fainted in my life is when i uh when I saw blood leaving my body when I was getting blood drawn once on accident. I'm not yeah. afraid of blood. I'm not afraid of my own blood. I'm not necessarily afraid of getting shots or anything like that. But the first time that I ever had blood taken from my body and I looked down and I saw it leave my, my like skin, I was just like, oh. And then I just like passed out. So it's it takes I almost it takes pass like out. Huh? It takes like a lot. I feel like to fail. Oh, yeah. It takes like a lot because like I almost pass out every time I get blood drawn. And the thing is like, I'm not afraid of blood. I'm not afraid of needles. I'm not afraid of shots. But like I have like I bring apple juice and peanut butter with me every time I go. And it's very funny because usually every time the nurse is like, well, actually the last time they don't make comments. And last time, um, like I got blood and like I couldn't, I stopped hearing. Mm -hmm. So that's not good. It, she, I think it's like an emotional or like a, a psychosomatic. Because I know they're not, they're, yeah, psychosomatic. Like they're not actually taking enough blood. But I like get tunnel vision and like everything sounds like I've got pillows over my ears. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like she drew blood, and then like she was like, you know, they eventually got me to, you know, to, to be like, hey, you know, it's over. And then she was like. Now I understand what the apple juice was for. She's like, I was wondering why you had apple juice <laughs> with you. I'm like, yeah, it's this is a thing that happens every time. It's and I don't know why. You know what I think happened in this story though, Brandon? I think she might have hit her fucking head. Based oh, on what I'm reading, she just might have hit her head and fainted. <laughs> it's <laughs> we gotta it's be possible. we gotta be careful. She might get a CTE and then like them. We don't just have a. a the polder guys, we got a serial killer on our hands. Or a sports announcer. Either way. Same difference. <laughs> Same difference. Hearing Esther's screams, Olive, Dan, William, and John rushed into the bedroom. Seeing the bedsheets lying in the corner of the room, Olive gathering them together and placed them over her ailing sisters. Almost immediately, the sheets flew back into the corner of the room in the same manner as before. Before anyone had time to react, the pillow upon which Esther's head lay hurtled through the air and struck John Teed in the face. Huh. Well, he, a pillow he, fight. He probably earned it. It's a, it's a pillow fight. It's time. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, uh, all the family members, aside from John, who fled the room from fear, sat on the edge of the bed in order really? to keep the sheets from flying off again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, after a, a succession of incredibly loud knocks sounded from beneath the bed, Esther's swelling subsided and she fell into a peaceful sleep. Um, she's got the sodium demon going on. Her just her limbs keep swelling. Oh, <laughs> um. <laughs> so this reminded me of The Exorcist. Uh, uh huh. But but the thing I want to talk about is not the movie The Exorcist, which has a really fucked up scene in which someone's back is permanently damaged. Uh, because the yeah. the produce the the director was a film auteur bullshit thing, and he yanked someone's spine so hard that it like was permanently damaged. I can't remember who it was, um, but but uh, I watched a countdown of the hundred most frightening or terrifying uh, 
moments of horror cinema. And yep. on that list, they had The Exorcist 2. And I, no, The Exorcist 3. The Exorcist 3. Have you seen The Exorcist okay. 3, Brandon? I don't think I have. It's, I saw the first one because I had, like, it's required reading at this point, and none of the others. You know, I've never actually seen the first one in its entirety. But, like, I, just I know it what's to, happening. To be able I know what happened. It. So, like, yeah. it's one of those things where I haven't watched it because, like, at this point, it's like, I, I know everything that happens pretty much. It's been talked about. It's kind of like death. Star Wars. If you've never seen Star Wars, you know the beats. Yeah. But um, yeah. the third Exorcist movie has a scene in it that they call the greatest jump scare of all time. And I strongly okay. disagree because I remember <laughs> watching it uh, years ago, like a, like a year ago or so for the first time. And I was watching yeah. it and I just was laughing my ass off when that jump scare <laughs> happened. It was the funniest jump scare in the world. Um, cause, cause like basically the camera stays in the, like a, a medium shot for a while. And then okay. like, you keep thinking that it's going to like, something's going to happen or something's going to pop out. Right. Um, yeah. Lady goes into her room. She walks back out of the room and then all of a sudden the like demon of the movie has like yeah. this pair of scissors, like for cutting off decapitating bodies <laughs> yeah, and yeah. is wearing like a, a white like sheet and just like kind of walks mm. out like this with their hands up <laughs> and they like kind of yeah it, and just like runs left to right out of the door that the lady just came out of and that's the jump scare that was on the list like of greatest horror movie moments of all time and i strongly disagree with that being if anything it's the funniest horror movie moment of all time there's, well, you know why it's so. That's what inspired uh, Weird Al's uh, album titled "Running with Scissors." Was that scene from Exorcist Three? No, it wasn't. Which is a a fun fact. No, it wasn't. The Weird Al movie came out, by the way. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet because I I don't I don't have my Roku set up, so I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I totally want to though. It's and I should I, think... I should caveat literally nothing in that is true. <laughs> Of course, none of that, nothing that happens in it is well, true. Well, the, the, Do, are, are there people actually thinking that it's like a doc? I don't know, but the the thing is, the dude who wrote it literally didn't like learn anything about Weird Al's backstory <laughs> deliberately. Yeah, which makes it even better. So I like, just want to point it. that out. It's that, a very like it's a very Al thing to do. It's a very Al thing to do. And it's like the 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 director of uh, Terrifier two because it's getting all this publicity because it's like too much for audiences to handle. Mm -hmm. Like his comment was like, "It's Terrifier two. Maybe watch the first one if you if horror movies aren't your deal." Like, <laughs> like no, he's like no, what you're getting into. Like the, his whole thing is like it's over the top, kind of. Like he's like that. That's the thing. If you don't don't uh. Terrifier made it into the list as well. Oh, did it? Yeah. It was good. I want to see Terrifier 2 yet. It, it's something something I didn't know, and it's because it was a super low-budget movie, was that the director also did all the practical effects. They actually like, the cut makeup. that person in half. They, they actually cut her in half. No, it's very clearly... Like, you can tell when it's uh, not no, no, a real... No, you, no. Can, you can tell when the transition happens. Um, no, you know, they... on account of, like, you'd be horribly vaped. No, like, they cut but her it, in it half. It worked out... Because he was able to design all the practical effects perfectly for, like, because he was also doing all the shooting, so he knew what was needed for the shot. So it came out really, really well, actually. Um, when a local doctor named Dr. Carete uh, was called to the Teed Cottage several days later to examine Esther's strange symptoms, they probably should have called him sooner, um, mm -hmm. he diagnosed her with nervous excitement and prescribed her a sedative to help treat it. So, so you weren't wrong, John. <laughs> you weren't wrong. What do you mean? <laughs> what did I say? Oh, like, uh, give her laudanum. Oh, yeah, no, that's literally that, like, I know how you deal with women in the 1800s. You just, yeah. sed you just sedate them. Yeah, like, you knock on the door and just go, where's the broad? <laughs> Here, and then he have some laudanum. Sedator. If it doesn't work, mix it with booze. Heroin hasn't been invented yet, so we can't give you that. Um, but have some laudanum. Maybe yeah. opium? Yeah. Smoke this twice a day and take it with whiskey. 
Don't worry, in a couple account- years we'll get access to the, the lobotomy. Then we can really take care of this problem. Oh yeah, wait until we can take an ice pick and some electricity to you. Mm-hmm. Really fix it up great. Yeah. And he- in his account, Walter Hubel reports that Dr. Uh, Coretti attempted his medical intervention for Esther Cox with strange effect. He informed me that on one occasion he had given her one ounce of bromide of potassium, um, which I forget what that is. That's a thing. I forget what thing that is, but that's very much a thing. And that's a lot of a very, that's a lot of that thing. He gave her an ounce of bromide of potassium. Followed by a pint of brandy. A pint. That's a glass of liquor. <laughs> it's an anti And a heavy... It's an What'd anti-convulsant. Uh, oh, good. <laughs> and a high dose will only will cause only nausea and vomiting. Which is why you chase it with a full glass of brandy and a heavy dose of morphia and laudanum on the same night. This is having a fucking party. See, I told you uh, it was going to be laudanum. Without the slightest effect on her symptom, she was violently throwing up in the corner, though. <laughs> he stated uh, on the same evening that all the medicine was neutralized by the ghosts. Yeah. Man of science right here. Which means, I think, I, neutr- oops, sorry, I bumped the mic. Uh, I think neutralized by the ghosts in air quotes means she already knew how to fucking party. I mean, also, isn't this like a combination of uppers and downers as well? Like, I, yeah, she's getting a speedball. So, like, <laughs> what the fuck do you expect is going to happen? Yeah. It's like, the doctor shows up and he's like, you're not sick, you just don't know how to fucking party. <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to party. Yeah. We're going to get like your group back. Every 80s music video ever. Here, have a bump of Coke. Yeah. We'll figure this out. See, your problem is you need to grow out just your pinky nail. Mm-hmm. A quick note on nervous excitement. Uh, nervous diseases uh, specialist Dr. <clears throat> Silas Weir Mitchell was consulted for treatment during an unhappy marriage. Uh, as one of many medical and scientific as experts who debated, in quotes, the woman question, he defended the, no- the notion of significant differences between the sexes and argued that an epidemic of neurasthesia or nervous exhaustion was rife among women who attempted to exceed their natural limits. So uh, so basically, this is this is them saying... This is them saying... You know, fuck women for like feeling as though they uh, they don't have rights or are being frustrated by the state of the world. They've got a disease because clearly yeah. they shouldn't be yeah. worried about this. <laughs> yeah, you know, like how like you can, sometimes like you can have emotions, and then like if the world is like specifically designed against you, that can maybe that could get to you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's nervous exhaustion because <laughs> they've exceeded their natural limits. It's like existing in capitalism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which, you know, might have some contribution to, like, massive amounts of alcoholism and drug abuse. Especially in the uh, Hudson Valley. Uh, uh, yeah, as a, a way of escaping uh, your material conditions, the etc. Um the doctor, who also got to witness some strange events, uh, arriving at the tea house at 10 o'clock that evening, he immediately examined Esther, who had already been in bed for an hour. As he spoke, Esther's pillow moved, moved laterally until only one corner was tucked under the girl's head. The doctor watched in amazement as the pillow returned to its former position without any external assistance. What? So, I do that what? when I sleep too, and that's called me sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, she likes the cold side of the pillow. Must be that ghost. I just, I, I'm, that is like the least surprising thing I've heard. 
Uh, did you see that? The doctor exclaimed. It went back again. The pillow's moving. I saw one of the babies looked me in the eye. It's a very Ralph. One of the babies licked you. Wait, what? It's a very a baby Ralph licked you in the eye. Looked me. It's like a very Ralph Wiggum quote. Oh, yeah. Remember, because like uh, Skinner and Krabappel were making out in a, a janitor closet. Uh, yeah. And they said that they had a baby, and Ralph Wiggum was like, and I, I, one of them looked me in the eye. That was like the joke he made. <laughs> References are great when I have to explain them. There's, I, it's been so long since I watched The Simpsons. Uh, so, so it did, replied John Teed. But if it moves again, moves out again, it will not go back, for I tend to hold on to it, even if it did bang me over the head last night. It's a fucking so pillow, dude. It's a pillow. He, he's being a whole brolic over a pillow. Uh, no sooner had he said this than the pillow moved laterally again, as if to challenge the young man. He's being stepped to by a pillow. This uh, also, John's the badass that was the only one that ran out of the room yeah, last so time. Yeah, so bad. So, like, so bad. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, though John gripped it with all his might, the pillow subsequently slid back under Esther's head as if it had encountered no resistance at all. John's hair stood on end. Shortly thereafter, loud knocks sounded from beneath the bed. Although the doctor examined the area from which the sounds had originated, he was unable to determine their source. He proceeded to walk out the room, and the knocking followed him, surrounding, or sorry, sounding from the floor beneath him. Uh, also, maybe look downstairs. I mean, that's one thing no one's done yet. Go downstairs. After a minute of knocking, the bedsheets once again flew into the corner of the room. Immediately, a scratching sound emanated from the wall behind the bed. Everyone in the room looked to ascertain the source of the noise. They saw that a disturbing message had been carved into the wall. Esther Cox, you are mine to kill. So no one took like a Degura type of this, this message that had been carved into the wall? Is that... When you like, like a rubbing, is that a Degura type? No, there's like a photo, fo- it's a form of photography that existed at this point in time. TYP, let's see, like a pinhole camera type, type dealio? Oh, the old timey, like yeah. that thing. Degura type. I gotcha, I didn't know that's what that was called. Yeah, it's like a silver nitrate based thing, it's, yeah. Yeah. Silver cop, yeah, it's, it's a- silver plated cop. It's a wood box with a, uh, yeah. uh, an opening on it, and you have silver-plated copper, and that, mm-hmm. that's what that is. All right. For three weeks, the strange activity increased in both frequency and intensity. Esther's invisible tormentor pelted her with objects like potatoes and wood planks. Fuck, it's she the Gary Ghost. <laughs> it's the Gary Ghost. He moved to Canada. Fuck. Uh, well, no, he's uh, from Canada, because this is before the Gary Ghost. Oh, yes. Oh, he, this is where he started out. Mm-hmm. Uh, often in the presence of her family members and made violent banging noises throughout the house. <laughs> Who the fuck is fucking around this house? It, are we you just hear a ghost screaming from the other room like, now you get on top. <laughs> it's like that scene from Scary Movie 2. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm about to ectoplasm. Oh. Where do you want it? The doctor who prescribed morphine to Esther in order to calm her shattered nerves went outside during one of these bagging sessions and <laughs> noted that uh, from the street, it sounded as if someone was standing on the cottage roof and pounding on the shingles with a sledgehammer. He's not into watching. <laughs> he is not into watching. Uh, One night in late September, during another knocking session, Esther had a seizure in her bed and had become cold and rigid. Um, In this alarming state, she told her family members who were in the room about the traumatic incident which had occurred between her and Bob McNeil, an incident of which none of them had any knowledge. Okay, so so I think we have a typo at the start of the story then. Oh, Bob Nickel is the demon. Oh, no, no. Okay, never mind. Now I'm I yep, yep, I have yep. it mixed up in my head. Got it. There's a lot of bobs. No, I got names mixed up. Uh, there's this their names. I hate their names. Continue. I'm not okay. I'm not at my A what? game today. Okay, my my <laughs> my ability to follow the thread of a story is not a hundred percent right now. When Esther recovered, her family members told her what she said. 
Although Esther had no recollection of making the confession, she tearily admitted that the story was true. Shortly after the incident, Jane observed the mysterious knocking had often seemed to correspond with things they said, as if the invisible agent that made sounds could hear and understand them. Dan decided to test his theory and ask the mysterious force to knock once for every person in the room. And sure enough, the entity responded with the correct number of raps, uh, which were violent enough to shake the entire house. This is, this is once again, I just want to point out that like knocking is usually the way that things work out in these spiritual things. And knocking can be achieved by like dislocating joints. Yeah, there's a, a great many number of methods you could use to produce a rap or a knock sound. Oh, although a rapping ghost would be freaking sick. Just some gnarly ass rhymes. Uh, throughout October, the Teed House was visited by several clergymen of different denominations who had heard of the strange activity and hoped to see it with their own eyes. A well-educated Baptist minister came away from the house, convinced that Esther, sorry, convinced that neither Esther nor her family members were responsible for the manifestations. Instead, he theorized that the shock resulting of Bob, the Bob McNeil incident had turned Esther into sort of an electric what? battery, and that Esther, Esther admitted invisible flashes of lightning that caused small thunderclaps. This bitch is an x-men i mean that'd be fucking dope but what the i mean fuck? that's that's as everyone knows in christianity if you've read the bible ever that uh you can turn into electric battery that shoots invisible thunderbolts ah uh, it's in there ah uh, yes psalm 27 <laughs> yeah <laughs> i forgot <laughs> It's in a poem. You have to read the context. It, it's it's in between the lines. It makes sense within the context. Yeah, you have to, you have it's, to interpret- it's in the third letter. It's interpretive. It's interpretive. It's, yeah. It's not, it's not it's in literal. It's the third letter of... <laughs> no, it's not literal at all. It, it's in the third letter of Cor- to, to Corinthians. And, um... It's right near... It's right there next to the stuff that the, uh... That Jesus says about gay marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> another, another man of the cloth... This one uh, Wesleyan Methodist preacher uh, witnessed a number of manifestations at the Teed home. Most startling of these involved cold water in a bucket, which, while standing on the kitchen table, began to bubble and froth as if it were boiling. Uh-huh. Um, okay. No, I want to point out that there's only two explanations for this. Uh, air was being introduced to it from the bottom, or it was actually boiling. Yeah. To, there's your two options. Yeah. And that could be achieved. You can boil, by the way, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with temperature. You could boil things through a pressure change. Um, the manifestations continued with casual frequency until December, whereupon Esther Cox uh, contracted diphtheria. Uh, during the two weeks it took for her to recover from this illness, the manifestations entirely ceased. Okay, so I want to take a second here. <laughs> To say, get your Tdap uh, vaccination, because then you'll just never get it. The what that vaccination? Tdap is oh, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. tetanus, diphtheria, what, it was one of the combo uh, ones. You have to, I, D, I, is Tdap one that you have to renew? I can't remember. It's a, every 10 years, but it's really like, if you're a kid, get it. Like, you give it to small kids, and you get it if you're going to be around small kids. Mm, okay. You don't really need it if, like, there's no one in, like, you're not going to be interacting with, like, babies. I, I do want to say that if we use Occam's razor here, um, she was sick, so she couldn't hoax anything. Yeah. <laughs> hey, those, uh, those, maybe those dots are some dots that no one else has ever connected with regard to this story. Uh, I doubt that, it's, but uh... clearly not at the time. <laughs> Oh, anyway, also, this is a very, I'm not going to make the jokes, but there's a lot of dick and ball jokes you could make about locations and names. Um, like Sackville? I'm going to take the high road. Upon her recovery, Esther Cox made a trap to Sackville, New Brunswick, to visit another of her sisters who was married. During the two weeks she spent in Sackville, neither her sister's house nor the teat home experienced any strange activity. Huh. 
Upon Esther's return to the Teed Cottage, she and Jan began sleeping in different rooms, hoping that this might put a stop to the affair. Instead, the activity had gotten even worse. I'm not saying there's a correlation between her being alone and it getting worse, but these are things that happen. In addition to producing loud noises and hurling objects around the house, the entity began dropping lit matches from the ceiling of Esther and Jane's what bedroom. What the fuck? <laughs> Uh, at night, a phenomena which all the family members witnessed. So the ghost is slowly turning into an arsonist. I don't know if that's even slowly. That's that's like a pretty rapid, uh, like escalation. Oh, from moving pillows yeah. to to lighting fires. Yeah, to like instantly yeah, going a... to matches. Like Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, that's n- non-linear. There, that's a that's a hefty curve. Um. On one occasion, while Dan, Olive, Jane, and Esther were in attendance, one of Esther's dresses had begun hanging from a nail on the door, rolled itself up, traveled underneath the bed, and burst into flames. Yeah, I believe that. On another... <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something you could do. If you had a string, and you, like, ran it up the nail and then down to the dress, if you were pulled yeah, down I know, on the string, like... the dress would curl up, and if you ran it under the bed... You... You just pull the pull Yeah, but the like still that's like not happening. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not happening. Uh, <laughs> uh, on another occasion, while Olive and Esther were alone in the house making butter, <laughs> uh, because that's a thing you used to have to do. <laughs> yeah, um, the fire started in the cellar. Unable to extinguish the inferno themselves, the women went out into the street and frantically called for help. A stranger whom they'd never seen before ran in... T- uh, ran into their uh, rescue and smothered the fire with a mat while uh, from the dining room. Uh, without waiting to be thanked, the man walked out the door and into the street, never to be seen again by the family. <laughs> that was that was actually Bob Nickel. That that was the the demon Bob. It's not the demon Bob. It's fire safety inspector Bob mm-hmm. Nickel. He just happens to have the same name as the demon. <laughs> He's like the Smokey the Bear of of Amher. He's like the 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 fire inspector cryptid. He just shows up when he's needed and then leaves without he's... a. Here, here's a Mandela uh, uh, effect thing for you. There's no the in Smokey the Bear. It has in been and always was just straight up Smokey Bear. Interesting. I always thought it was Smokey the Bear. Until I heard a radio ad, and it was it sounded like Betty White, Only you uh, like can some lady forest fires said Smokey Bear and go to SmokeyBear dot com, and it's like, isn't there a the? And it's like maybe they rebranded. I did some searching. It's just always been Smokey Bear, and I just always put a the huh. in there because it makes more sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because Smokey's uh, not a first in name. The ensuing... <laughs> it, no. Uh. The, in the ensuing weeks, the ghost began to speak to Esther, although only she could hear mm-hmm. it. Again, there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of thoughts this family's not yes. connecting. Then one cold winter night, while the family was lounging in the parlor, Esther suddenly rose to her feet with a look of horror on her face and pointed with a trembling hand to the corner of the room. Look there, she croaked. Look there. Can't you see it? My God, it's the ghost. Don't you all see him? They didn't. Yeah, so here's the thing. Like, now that I'm, like, thinking about this critically, um, so this is, like, 1878. No, 79. Yeah, 78, 78. Okay. So this is, like, 1878. They got fuck all to do. So, like, I get it. Like, if there's nothing to do and you're just living in a multifamily home... Darius Anding, she loves pranks. I remember, I remember high school and a mutual friend saying that he saw a ghost, and everyone kind of like feeding into it. Oh yeah, all the time, like a lot. It was like, the best. Frequently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the spring of 1879, Esther traveled to Saint John, New Brunswick, at the invitation of a certain military officer. During her three weeks stay. Uh, in the city, Esther was visited by a party of scientifically minded gentlemen who developed a new method of communicating with Esther's poltergeist. After asking the entity a question, 
they would recite the alphabet and wait for the thing to knock at the appropriate letter, repeating this procedure until the entire answer was spelled out. Jesus Christ. The longest possible way to ever... Yeah. That's the worst. It's not great. That's not good at all. Uh, by this method, the poltergeist identified itself to them as Bob Nickel, uh, <laughs> which just happens to be the name that Henry Cavill gave it at the top of the episode. Well, and she not Henry Cavill. Just... Yeah. His name wasn't Henry Cavill. That that that's that's the joke, because that's the name I confused with Harry Houdini, which was like in a so the guy was like the Harry Houdini. We're like three layers down into this callback. Okay. It's okay. great. Cool. And claimed that it had once worked as a shoemaker. Uh, to the men's astonishment, other spirits also began to so, make themselves known. So I have known. a question. Do you think? Do you think yeah. that what happened was she was originally going to have it be Bob McNeil? But she didn't make the knocking noise quick enough, and they went from end to end too quickly, and she had to like, like write herself I improvise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, that's gotta. It, it's one letter at a time. It's gotta be just like brutal. Like nobody has to have anything better to do if that's what you're doing. I mean, it's 1879. So <clears throat> yeah, I guess they didn't have Chainsaw Man to watch. I mean, back then. also like. I will say this, uh, research hadn't really been done on, like, the supernatural, so, like, there is this part of me that, like, is also kind of like, yeah, but, like, somebody had to do this stupid thing, right? It's stupid as shit to us now, but, like, at one point, yeah. it was like, well, let's just check to see, and now we have a body of evidence that points to, no, it's bullshit, right? So, like... Yeah. At one point, this all was like legitimately reasonable things to do to test hypotheses, and now it's just like, yeah, no. Yeah. We have we have the uh, uh. we have the benefit of time. Yeah. Remember, true. science changes. Uh. What the definition of like valid science is changes depending on our current understanding of the world. Ah, uh, that's why we don't have humors anymore. Mm. Well, that wasn't science in the first place, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Uh, one ghost identified herself as Maggie Fisher, while the other called himself Peter Cox and claimed he was a relative of Esther's who died about 40 years hmm. prior. Later on, three uh, more mild-mannered spirits made their presence known, identifying themselves as Mary Fisher, who said she was Maggie's sister, Jane <laughs> Nichol... And Eliza Interesting McNeil. that Jane Nickel has the same name as her sister. <laughs> yeah, has the same name as her sister and the yeah. demon. After a peaceful eight-week stay with a particular family who lived in Nova Scotia countryside, Esther Cox returned to Amherst with the manifestations resumed immediately and as powerful as ever. At this point... Uh, an enterprising American named Dr. Walter Hubel, who had just finished a, th finished a theatrical tour in Newfoundland, moved in with the Teed family as a paying uh, boarder in hopes of documenting the this, manifestation. This, this house it, is fucking filled to the gills. It's like packed. The house how is How many packed. people is this now? This is like, uh, uh, let's see, two, God, four, it's gotta be like se five... Six, seven, eight. This is like the eighth person, if my count is right. Yeah, and that's not and it, counting like the temporary visitors of like random doctors. And it was and also priests. called a cottage too. So like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. It, it's getting pretty loaded in there. Uh, and it's from Hubel's subsequent writings that most of the details uh, of the in quotes great Anhurst mystery uh, he styled it are known. Um, over the course of six weeks, Hubel was pelted with inanimate objects, saw household items vanish and reappear as if dropped from the ceiling, watched objects levitate and translocate, and witnessed several fires break out spontaneously. This ghost has got to chill with the fire. Uh, all the antics had an air of mischief, as if the poltergeist was doing their best to annoy, doing their best to annoy the guest and the family. Hewell had noted that the ghost refrained from any uh, de devilry on the Sabbath. 
So Sunday, you're it, safe. Wouldn't wouldn't that be the time that the that the devil like the the ghost would do the thing though? Like, because isn't like it usually a nope. mockery of of stuff? Like that's the whole joke. But like, maybe like it's a a Christian ghost that is also observing yeah, the but Sabbath. Like, what? <laughs> what? What are you even trying to say there? Convince. The, well, it may be if the ghost was by someone who is strongly religious and no matter what would would uh, observe well, the Sabbath, it might account for also well, the devil. like, okay. So, if... So, I'm saying, like, maybe Esther's observing the Sabbath. If I was Sabbath. a strongly religious ghost, I'd be pissed as shit. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like... I wouldn't give a shit about the Sabbath because I would be pissed. Yeah. Right? Like. Yeah. Uh, con- convinced that Esther was incapable of conducting the pranks herself, Hubel began to converse with the poltergeists using the name techniques that the Teeds had developed. The ghosts accurately told him this is oh, okay. the alphabet A, B, C, knock. Oh, I knocked and bumped my mic. Um, the ghosts accurately told him the time on his watch, and guessed how many coins he had in his pocket. Hebel then asked the spirits the following questions, which they answered with knocks, which, um... So, God, this man I, had free I wanna, time. I want to point out that he's, like, he was convinced that Esther was incapable of pulling these pranks by herself. Okay. So, Jane could totally be in on it, but also, you're, like, really underestimating this person. Because... <laughs> Oh, no, I think this is all in the same, like, it, the doctor goes, oh, it's a woman. Give her a uh, uh, bromine yeah. or whatever. Like, or they just, like, they constantly, like, you know, that attitude towards women. I think he also has that same attitude where he's like, she's a woman. She couldn't possibly figure out how to knock. Like, it's that attitude, I suspect. Uh, so, question. Have you all lived on Earth? Answer, yes. Have you seen God? Answer, no. Are you in heaven? Answer, no. Are you in hell? Answer, yes. Have you seen the devil? Answer, an empathetic yes. It, it must have been a, a softer what? rapping. I, like, how how can you empathetically answer yes? Oh, wait, wait. Through not Emphatic. I, it wasn't empathetic. It's emphatic, meaning... Oh, I misread yeah. that. I now, Not only did I misread that now, I misread you that did. in August because I have a little note in parentheses. They should have used... Me- Morse code existed <laughs> at this point. They should have taught the ghost Morse code. That would have yeah. been a lot faster. On June 28th of 1878, the Teat House resounded to the sound of a trumpet... The strident noise continued throughout the day until the evening. A small silver trumpet fell from the ceiling into one of the rooms. Neither Hubel nor any members of the Teed family had any idea where the trumpet came from. Although Hubel later declared his intention to donate the instrument to a museum, the fate of this object, to the best of the author's knowledge, remains a mystery to this day. She went out and bought herself a trumpet. That's, That's pretty great. I'm happy with that. Like, ugh. The manifestations increased in scope and intensity until that summer. It was decided that Esther Cox had to leave the Teeds' home for everyone's sake. After embarking on a brief speaking tour with Walter Hubble, uh, during which she was heckled by audience members who believed her to be a fraud, Esther went to live in the home of a friend of the Teed family. Shortly after her arrival, the family's barn burned to the ground and Esther was I mean, accused of arson. I mean, she seems like an arsonist. So yeah, she... <laughs> Seems like an arsonist to me. Um, she was subsequently sentenced to four months in prison, uh, but was released after one month on account of good behavior. After her release, Esther married a man who had come to visit her during her imprisonment. Uh, following her marriage, the poltergeist activity okay. stopped for good. Yeah, so, so sounds to me like she just wanted to get the fuck out of that overcrowded house. Yeah, she just wanted to get out of the house so bad she was willing to either arson or marry a guy with the house. She tried the arson and that didn't work, so she went for round two. Um, My thoughts on this are that, sure, uh, there may have been something going on 
uh, at the teen house, uh, there were a few other ghost events going on uh, at the time, which I will not discuss as they will be part of a grab bag in the future uh, that I've written. Uh, the key info about this whole ordeal is that the Hubel's, uh, or, or, where's that Hubel's writing is where the bulk of this so information dude, comes from. It's basically like the dude. Yeah. The actor, the, the actor? actor magician. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, he was also an actor. Like he was just a st- uh, all around stage performer. Um, a piece of information that I had omitted uh, was that after these events at the Hubble House, uh, Hubel published and distributed his writings uh, all over, from New York to Chicago to Paris, and he was charging 25 cents Canadian. a pop, roughly $7.80 a day, or sorry, $7.80 today. Uh, and at nearly 187 pages, it was a great bang for your buck, and he really knew how to punch up a story. All right, so... All of the crazy stuff likely was yeah. Hubel writing in a book to sell more yeah. of the book. Um, the whole thing is available as a scan online, and I suspect this to be a, a fabrication, or much of it to be a fabrication, uh, but he sure was a compelling writer. Uh, just a random click to any page uh, will read as, the invisible power within the atmosphere manifested its presence day after day, calculated to strike dismay and terror into the heart of I mean, the bravest man. I gotta say, that just sounds like a teenage girl. Yeah, it does. Uh, like, he, he had a writing style that would jarringly cut to, like, plain, straightforward narrative of experts coming in with a theory and failing to disprove it in plain language, creating, like, an A and B plot that would switch from page to page from like a thrilling mystery to just a straight shooting who done it logic uh, that was sure to capture the interest of like anyone who was reading it. Uh, and if I remember, I'll post a link to the scanned uh, copy of his book in our Discord. Uh, and it also had some like cool ads in the back for like upright pianos and the such. It was like a pretty cool old timey huh. book. Yeah, so that was probably bullshit. Oh, the whole thing. So I'm sure she was like doing knocks and throwing matches at her sister or whatever. But like the 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 really over the top stuff. Um, he he was selling books. He yeah. was moving copies. I mean, uh, I think there. I like, think I'm sure people have pointed this out in the past, but like the whole spiritualist movement was like a way for women to take power back in a system that didn't give them rights to power, right? If my memory is correct, I I vaguely remember stuff like it, that. It was, if that's the case, that's kind of cool to a certain extent. Like the taking advantage of people, not cool, but using people's like the way that they look at and treat you, knowing that they'll disregard your ability or diminish your ability. Like you'll be able to trick them better and easier because they will think you're less capable because you're a woman. That's cool. Like, use yeah, that I mean, against it's, them. It's a very, uh, it's like a very, like, it's a way to subvert the, the power dynamics of the current time period for um, Victorian era, right? That would be Victorian era. Yeah, women. Yeah, I actually don't know when Victorian era is. I, I use it to describe uh, an aesthetic, but sure don't actually know Queen Victoria, when it was. So that would be the 1800s. I mean, that that makes sense. I just don't know when that... Let's see. From 1837 to 1901. So, yeah, that was uh, the Victorian area, for sure. Yeah, because it was... Victorian British history, 1820... Period of Queen Victoria's reign. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's probably bullshit. But fun story. Weird story. Questionable story. This is a fun story. He was moving copies. Oh. Uh, I'm going to post the book in our uh, Discord, so if anyone wants, go there. I highly, even if you just peruse, like, a page or two, definitely give it a shot, because it, it's a pretty cool book. And then flip to the back and look at all the cool old-timey ads. All right. Um, so then in that case, I guess our episode's over. Indeed it is. So our website is com. Our Instagram is at cryptopediacast. I posted a reel of the Shanley Hotel. Oh, I saw that. Oh, speaking of which, uh, really quick. 
Really quick Shanley Hotel update. Do, 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 oh, do, what's do, this? Do. So I went to the sh- so I went to the Shanley Hotel in person. You you already know all this. Yeah. This is me just reporting for people who weren't on the Discord. Oh, okay. So I went to the Shanley Hotel in person. Um, I want to make a few things clear. Uh, you can stand at an intersection and see 209, which is a major highway in the area, the Walmart and the Shanley Hotel, as well as the weird well that supposedly the, that, that the, the girl <laughs> fell down, all from the same spot just by turning 360 degrees and not moving your feet. <laughs> um, I have a video showing that. It is 100% accurate. It's so um, funny. It's so funny. So the comment you put on the video is like middle of nowhere. And it's just you panning slightly to the left from the Shanley Hotel to the Walmart. <laughs> yes, it's it's pretty great because the funniest thing is um, most of the time people are pulling down the road that literally leads to the Walmart uh, yeah. in the videos as they're saying that, um, <laughs> which is the funniest thing in the world to me. Really, really fucking funny. Um, second thing, uh, the ghost... I think it was the ghost hunter said that people cross the road. Um, I know for a fact they don't because I knew I saw at least two people walking by it. I saw a giant group of people going into a convenience store that is literally right next to the Shanley hotel. That was like completely hopping because the time of day was um, lunchtime. So people were getting lunch like a fuck ton of people. Somebody honked at me really loud. I don't know who it was or why they did it. That happened. Um, not much else to say there. The place does look like a piece of shit still. Uh-huh. Uh From the exterior, uh, there there are some there are several windows that are currently covered by boards, <laughs> it, by plywood. Would you say it looks uh, <laughs> worse than it did from when it was condemned? Possibly, potentially, because more more time um, has passed, so it's probably weathered more. Yes. So, um, I couldn't find any records about the condemnation unfortunately. Um, but that's because I also didn't go to the, the county clerk office because I was lazy. I think it was um, something that was a structural issue. It was a structural issue, but I didn't, I didn't get the full oh, like, the, the specifics. Report. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, as far as I can tell, the person who owns it was who currently has ownership of it is Sal Nicosia's, uh, uh, ex fiance. And I say ex fiance because Sal died before they got married. So I'm like 90% sure she has the rights to the place. Okay. I erroneously said that he lost it in a divorce. That wasn't true. Um, I misread the document. I was able to also track the the sales of the place back to um, to confirm the general history of like transactions. Yeah. Um, so that, that was possible because uh, I was able to look through that. Also, um, other update. Your local state or local counties like record service of documents that have filed been filed with the county is horrifying. That's just a fact. <laughs> There's a lot of shit in there. Yeah. Um like that's how I found out about the divorce in the first place was because mm-hmm. of the fact that the divorce proceedings were available online for free. <laughs> um uh, the the that being said, like the exact court documents weren't shown, just the names of the documents. Yeah. Um I think I'd have to go for like I like, I'd have to actually put a request in for the full documents. You'd have to um put a request in or if it's similar to I tried doing some document lookups for the town of Socrates. There's an online portal, but you have to pay like a subscription service to like have access to all the documents within the portal. So yeah. you might have to do something similar if they're treating it in a similar manner uh, as that town. Also, um, there was another abandoned building right across the street from the Shanley that looked way creepier than the Shanley did, <laughs> um, which is fucking funny. So I also went to the library, okay, the Ellenville Library, which is a nearby town. Yeah, uh, and I got access to the the vertical files. Oh, nice! And they had a they had a record of um, the Shanley Hotel. Nothing before Sal Nicosia purchasing the the hotel referenced this, the referenced the ghost at all. Gotcha. Whatsoever. Um. Everything everything about ghosts shows up after Sal Nicosia buys the property in two thousand five. Um. Prior to that, I did find uh that the house was originally okay. So basically, what <laughs> happened was in seventy six there was a bunch of problems. Okay. With the property. Oh, wait. Do I have the notes right here? 
Oh, I sure do. Don't I? Huh. <laughs> uh, so 76, uh, it was reported as being a nuisance. Public drinking, fighting, lewdness, all that good stuff. Par for the um, course for the area. Yep, yep, yep. I am I mean, pretty much what I knew. And I actually was able to confirm that because my dad was on the police force at the time. Um, and he was in the sheriff's department. So the sheriff's department, because that's that, that particular town doesn't have its own police department. So the county sheriff's department would take effect. Right, okay. For for policing it, so sheriff department was called there on several occasions. I asked my dad if he, he knew it was haunted. He said yes, um, but I want to say uh, immediately, immediately after I asked that and he told me that, uh, I was going to go to a, like a trunk or treat with my niece and nephew and all that stuff. Yeah. Like just for a second, just to say hi, everyone. Blah 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 blah. Uh. And he told me the wrong place, the wrong parking lot to go to. <laughs> so take that with what I what, take that as you may. Um, in '93, after the hotel was, uh, so I think that there's a, a mistake in the timeline because I found an article that said in '93 was when the hotel stopped operation for the first time as a bar. Okay. Um, so that might have been an issue, but. Uh, in 93, there was also interest in developing it into shelters for affordable housing. And okay. some bitch uh, totally nimbied it and went around and got a a petition signed to like be like, not in my backyard. Oh, God. Uh, so that happened. Oh. Um, let's see. What else? Do, 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 do. Uh, I have a, a lead to follow up on with somebody, but I don't know if that's going to work out. Um, they said that they were offering it for reasonable prices in 2008, which if my memory was correct, I still saw the pricing and the pricing was insane. Um, oh, man. And s while Sal Nicosia was in charge of the place, they deliberately didn't uh, allow Ouija boards because he didn't want them to provoke the spirits. Um, that might have oh, been yeah, a marketing I thing. Yeah. It's all a marketing also, thing, never mind. Yes, it's entirely a marketing thing. I also was unable to find any mentions of it being a brothel at any point in any of the literature I found. So, okay. obviously, this is not all the possible places that could be mentioning things, but all the reliable sources in, like, first, uh, like, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? Primary sources that I could find, nothing is pointing to any part of the story being even remotely true. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and you would think, given the stories of what happened at the 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 brothel and the thing there with the barber and, and, and the murder and all that, you would mm -hmm. expect something to be available somewhere that yeah. would verify that claim. Well, and it, it's I not. would have I would have expected it to be in the vertical files. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it wasn't. So. I'm until I have evidence to prove otherwise, I'm going to say that the whole thing is bullshit and marketing. Um but yeah, so that that's the update on the uh the the, the Shanley Hotel. Did I say Stanley earlier? Nice. I totally did. Shanley. Um but anywho, uh the reason I mentioned that is because their video one of the videos is up on our Instagram at Cryptopediacast. Um we also have a Twitter at Cryptopediacast, although Given the current state of Twitter, who knows how long that will continue to exist? <laughs> <laughs> every every verified account now is just ch like at Elon Musk all, or all, like pretending at Elon, Elon Musk, Musk. with yeah. a picture of him when he was balding. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty fucking great. <laughs> yeah. Imagine spending that kind of money and then just getting relentlessly trolled by forty four. Was it forty four? Forty four billion. Billion. Or a million? billion. Forty four billion dollar sale. And now you're just hemorrhaging advertisers and everyone's trolling you. Yep. And, well, the, the funniest thing is he's like, activists said this. And then immediately an advertiser was like, no, we were on a call together and we told you why we're pulling our advertisements. <laughs> yeah. It's because we don't like the direction of the platform. Yeah. <laughs> um. So if you have any ideas or for episodes or stuff like that, questions, yada, yada, yada. Email us at critpucast at gmail.com. Yeah, email us. Join the Discord if you want. We'll, yep. We're available there. Uh, the YouTube now has a sane link. It's at Critopedia. Um Hell yeah. Somehow I was able to secure that. Uh, and um, we also have a Patreon that 
pays the bills for the server to host the episodes. Um, and we got some jackalopes who I'll be thanking. So we got our perennial favorites, Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, Matthew Smith, Will Smith, Lenwood Sharp, and of course, Bushcraft Kelso. Um, Hell yeah. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to rate and review, subscribe, all that good stuff. We did get a new review on uh, iTunes that was that was positive, so that was cool. Um, ah. So shout out to the person who did that, whose name I don't remember because I forgot to look it up before the episode and my computer runs too slow, so I'm not going to go look it up now. Um, <laughs> uh, if you have any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. Hell yeah. You could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon. Yes. Um, I'm on Instagram at mu2057. My uh, Twitter is at JF Dunham for however, once again, however long that lasts. My website is johndunhamgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. In one second, I will tell you the name of the person. Action Jack. Action Action Jack. Thank you for your review. Such kind words warm our cockles. Uh, Our art was done by Tom... Words. Was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at thomasmichaelhill. His website is greatergloryco.com. And his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things have been weird.